Welcome to the Qigong Global Summit, presented by the Shift Network. And now your host, Sharon Rose. Good day, everyone. I'm Sharon Rose, your host for the Qigong Global Summit with the Shift Network. And today we have a very special treat, Adam Apollo. Adam has been working in the field of personal and global transformation for many years, so this is really exciting. He's been a featured speaker at the White House, United Nations, and at conferences and festivals around the world. In the Qigong perspective, he studied in the direct lineage of Cheng Man Ching and is an active teacher in the field of unified physics, movement arts, and self-mastery studies with over 40,000 students across three online academies. It's so nice to be with you, Adam. Mm, Thank you so much, Sharon. It really is an honor and pleasure to be here with you. And this time is such a powerful and potent time. I'm very thankful that we have the opportunity to share some of these transmissions about working with Qi uh, right now, because the earth is going through a lot of changes. Um, I know a lot of us are witnessing what's happening in the Amazon, and there are great events and confluences of people happening. And it's really an important time for us to develop mastery around our chi and our key, as we may call it. Um, I've personally been feeling like my dreams are just as real and vivid as my waking life and feeling this wave of vitality come in um, in the mornings, stimulating thought and inspiration and thinking. So it's a deep honor to be with you here right now. Oh, thank you. Yes, I feel that we're in this time of real alchemical transmutation mm-hmm. from every, you know, every perspective that you have studied and I have studied all these years. And yes, we're dealing with a lot. It's like every, all the darkness is arising mm-hmm. out through the mainstream to be liberated and transmuted into this delicious, delightful chi life force energy so tell Mm. us a little about your background and how you came to be part of this global Mm. transformation and uh, your project unify yeah well my journey with unify came a long time after my initial sort of awakening to this world Um, when i was in high school i was deeply dissatisfied with a lot of the answers that I was given to critical questions about life, about reality, about energy, about what heat is, for example. Um, And, you know, I was generally an agnostic and, you know, fairly atheist, um, but mostly because I couldn't get those critical questions answered. And when I was about 11, uh, my stepmother, who had dedicated her life to teaching people about divine love and about God and was super spiritual and very, very psychic. She solved crimes with psychic abilities, things that I just didn't understand at that time. Um, She passed away uh, very violently in a car accident. And I was on my way back from India where I had been visiting Marizad, uh, which is uh, Meher Baba retreat center with my mother because my grandparents on my mom's side Uh, were connected to him. So I was surrounded by these different sort of spiritual concepts and phenomena like psychic abilities. And there was things that I witnessed that I couldn't explain, but nobody could give me any answers about it. And it took until I was about 15, exploring with close friends and one brother in particular, really questioning how it is that you could feel it when someone's looking at you from across the room or why your ears would burn when somebody is talking about you or how you could think of someone and then they call you on the phone. And the result of our inquiries was basically doing an experiment where we put our fingertips together like this and slowly separated them. And I was watching and looking in that space between my fingertips And I started to feel this tingle 
and and gave it a little bit of a push. And I could see these very subtle waves passing between my fingers. And all of a sudden, it was as if this little light popped on in the middle of my head and my whole body got chills. And I felt like, my God, I just I discovered the force. (laughs) The force is real. And, um, you know, as a 15 year old kid, you discover something that you can't see that's tangible and you start experimenting with it and realizing you can locate objects in the room while you're blindfolded. Uh, Chris and I used to do blindfolded martial arts and go faster and faster and faster. Um, and, and I didn't, I, I thought we were discovering something that nobody had any knowledge of. And then I began, as I was studying its properties and the ways that it moved, I began searching online. And, you know, this was the Internet in the 90s, which there you know, wasn't the kind of Google and resources that there is now. But I came across uh, a variety of different ancient traditions that described this same vital force, this this sort of underlying vibrational field that is related to consciousness. And, uh, and one of those lineages was of course the lineage of, uh, Qigong and Tai Chi and, uh, the Chinese and Japanese and sort of deeper Taoist approaches to understanding the vital life force energy. Um, and I realized that just as I had been playing with the flow of this field and, and working with it and sort of noticing that it would take on qualities of fire and qualities of water and qualities of air and qualities of earth, um, that I was doing Tai Chi. And since I was very, very little about, you know, really three or four years old, I had always, um, practice martial arts. I I was very into movement and uh, expression in the body and battling, you know, with close friends. And I had tried taking many different kinds of martial arts classes, but I was always very dissatisfied with them. And I usually ended up quitting because I felt like the way the teacher was teaching it or what I was being taught was just wrong. And I'd watch the black belts and I'd be like, that's that's stupid. Why is this, you know, why is this guy going like this? So blocky, like there's no skill to that. And, and I didn't know why I felt like there was no skill to it. But in this time as a teenager, as I began awakening to this underlying field, suddenly all of this awareness and knowledge began to flood into me about how chi and energy moves and how every martial art is really an extension of this internal art of the field that we cultivate inside of us. So that was really the beginning of my journey. Um, <laughs> and I, I became highly interested in revolutionizing education because of that. Um, and I, you know, dove deeply into, uh, the study of physics in high school, particularly, uh, special and general relativity, quantum mechanics, uh, super string theory, uh, and M theory, of course, as an extension of that, uh, loop quantum gravity, um, and supersymmetry and, you know, quantum lattice theories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I was looking for is with all of these very brilliant physicists, why didn't we have a scientific description for this underlying field? Uh, It just blew my mind. Like, how could this not be part of our science? It's so obvious. I'm a 15 year old kid and I discover it. Everybody has these phenomena and in their experience, but yet we're not being taught anything about it in school. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, and as I began to really dive deeply into the study of physics, I began to realize that all of these different branches of theoretical physics all seem to be pointing at this, this kind of missing solution that there must be some kind of underlying field. And it's right there in Einstein's general relativity, because in general relativity, Einstein describes space time as this sort of, uh, structure that curves and bends around centers of mass. 
and its curvature actually can bend light. And that suggests that there's some kind of fundamental field or substance. And it took until many years later when I actually realized that Einstein actually tried to bring the ether back into physics um, at that time, even though his work in special relativity sort of knocked it off the table. He tried to bring it back because he realized that you can't have these mechanical properties to space time itself in the way that it interacts with light and all of these things, unless there is some kind of underlying fundamental mechanical field. And yet all that work was ignored. In fact, most people don't even know Einstein wrote a paper on the ether. You can search for it right now. It'll come up in a university archive called Einstein and the ether. Um, you'll also see some writings that I've done on that front. Um, which I think are essential. And, and I also, you know, personally uh, felt that with pieces like as big as that missing from our standardized education, uh, we needed to do something to revolutionize education and thought. And so I became a very avid proponent of new education systems and formulas uh, that led me to be a speaker at the International Symposium on Digital Earth in San Francisco, where I spoke alongside at the, as a keynote speaker at the gala dinner alongside uh, Google and satellite agencies, and then got invited to be a, a attendee and speaker at the Next Generation Leadership Summit at the White House. And following that, was invited uh, as a speaker to the uh, Nexus summits at the United Nations. Um, and I just continued over the years to, uh, to build and refine systems for new education until eventually I could uh, build my own online schools and education frameworks and began really prototyping and templating what that new education formula could look like. Um, and then as I was just kind of, uh, about to really dive into that, um, I had an opportunity through meeting a brother named Adil Kassam and, uh, Patrick Cronfley. Um, Adil wanted to do a next generation live aid concert, like raise money through doing a bunch of big events and make big impact in the world. And Patrick was, uh, doing a project called MedMob where he was getting people meditating together in city hall buildings. And I was doing these things called global telepathic conjunctions, where I got all my Jedi friends uh, or people that are aware of this fundamental field and were actively participating in how we can change and shape the field of the planet to bring greater awareness and consciousness. Um, and together, uh, we sort of came to this idea of merging meditation mobs with major events on sacred sites with synchronized meditation, telepathic connection, um, and you know, what might be called magical work, but, uh, to us, it's really just awakening work. It's really just enhancing and connecting coherent consciousness around the planet and unify was born out of that. Um, and in 2012, we uh, linked up events in Chichen Itza with Stonehenge and, um, you know, New York and Jerusalem. And I did an event with the Do Lab at the Pyramids of Giza and Egypt. Um, and we had a fantastic, amazing series of uh, very, very powerful synchronized events all around the world. And we worked with the Shift Network actually at that time to even expand that network. Um, as well as Uplift and uh, Mark Healy was a very close collaborator of ours for many, many years, still is. Um, and, uh, and that was really the birth of Unify. So in many ways, the trajectory that I've been on is, is all oriented around the question of how do we get in touch with the deeper reality that we're actually immersed in, that we're not being taught in schools? How do we educate each other? in order to empower each other to be more healthy and more full of this life force that is our fundamental right? And then how do we create coherence as communities to come together to really build the neosphere, as Telhard de Chardin would call it, or the global telepathic field and bridge so that we are all working in a greater state of coherence and harmony with each other all around the planet?
we have so much resonance, so much in common. I feel that we've been, you know, both really working towards the same kind of vision. I started also very young, uh, opening to perceiving energy and particularly emotions, worked in schools and have had a vision of bringing these teachings from so many traditions as well into Mm -hmm. mass consciousness. So tell us, how can we tap into this field? How can we use the knowledge that you've gained in order to help us not only heal ourselves, but bring Mm. this beauty of these teachings to the world? Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, You know, it's interesting because a lot of people think that you have to think a lot about it or that it requires a lot of conceptualization. Um, When I was in college, I had the opportunity to study under a gentleman named Brent Neely. And Brent was uh, a skydiver and he taught Tai Chi at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. And studying under Brent, uh, he, he would not focus at all on the reality of this fundamental field or talk about energy or talk about any of the metaphysics of this experience, he focused very, very simply and, and fully on the principles of Tai Chi and the practices, because that's the way he learned it from Benjamin Lowe, who was his teacher. And Benjamin Lowe's teacher was Cheng Meng Ching, um, who is a student of Yang Cheng Fu and Yang Cheng Fu learned from Yang Cheng Yao. And that lineage goes on back um, through the Yang family. And this, this, uh, this art of Tai Chi is something that doesn't require much mental work at all. If you practice the postures and you practice the movements, um, what most of the masters teach in a lot of their sort of sacred libraries and, and the, the few really good translations and writings of their ancient scrolls, um, is that through the direct experience of doing the practice and just allowing yourself to go through the motions, there is a moment where your breath and the practice uh, and the mind become still enough that you see the flag, so to speak. And when they say seeing the flag, what they're talking about is actually witnessing chi for the first time, actually experiencing the key in the body and through the body and the body as a conduit of this field. And, and then we began to notice that mind intent is sort of this powerful force of origin that can direct where the chi and the key goes. And when we realized that, then we began to see that it's not so important what we're thinking about as how we are intending and, and what the directionality and flow of that intention may be. And that the flow of mind intent then actually moves the chi and the motion of the chi then also moves the blood. And so you can think of this as the mind moving the emotional field or the etheric field or what we call chi, ki, prana, etc. And then that field then moving the physical field, which we experience as the blood and sinew and the aspects of the body. And so by understanding these three layers of our being and getting more deeply tuned to what we're experiencing physically and contemplating on our physical experience, what we're experiencing emotionally, and actually learning how to really feel and acknowledge and witness what we're feeling emotionally without judging it, um, and doing what Richard Rudd of the Gene Keys calls pivoting. In other words, contemplating on what you're feeling and then 
learning how to witness that what it is isn't defining you. It's just part of the flow of the field or the energy. And that if you can just accept it and allow it to flow, then you can sort of Aikido that emotional field and you can allow that energy just to pass through you as a conduit instead of it getting stuck in you by you resisting and rejecting the field of that energy. So, and the mind works the same way because in the mind, we, we build these different systems of belief that become like lenses that filter the light that is moving through us. And the lenses of our different belief systems can become so obfuscated that that much of the truth, in other words, much of the light that is the information around us in space time actually can't even penetrate through the filter anymore. And so we start seeing the world through whatever colored glasses we're wearing. And this becomes a big problem because as these belief systems really set in, what happens is we stop receiving new information, even when there is something that's there to disrupt our old way of thinking and to get us trying something new. And when we, when we have this sort of wall in our mind intent and our thinking space, then we also start blocking the emotional field. And then what happens is the body stops being able to flow and process chi through all of the meridians and through the areas of the body as well, which then results in illness. And so healing and transformation of the self is actually a process of in many ways, first, just loosening up some of those belief system constructs that we have. You know, if you if you're sure that, you know, a certain thing in history happened exactly that way or that you were the one who was totally right in that relationship, um, you could actually be holding a block towards a feeling that's underlying uh, that experience that actually contains more information about it. And we usually hold up those blocks because we're afraid. But if we're willing to say, well, maybe it isn't the way I thought it was. Maybe I don't entirely understand it. Maybe there is more to the story than what the Spaniards said about, you know, coming to South America. Maybe there's there's more to this picture than what I've been taught. Um then all of a sudden the space where you're afraid and where you've been blocking the energy of the new information starts to loosen. And as that starts to loosen, you may start experiencing whatever emotions were really underlying that. And you might have anger towards the relationship. You might have rage, you might have grief and sadness. And if you can allow those things to flow, then suddenly parts of the body begin to open up and you begin to realize your digestive system is shifting. Uh, there's places where you had restriction in your breath that start to open up and suddenly the whole body starts to integrate that new field of information. And oftentimes that then feeds back to the mind, allowing new knowledge to come forth and new realizations, which is what, you know, the Zen masters and the Taoists called Satori, where you create enough of a field of charge in the body to allow the thunder or the lightning strike to hit. And that brings this new information, which is a revelation, which can transform uh, your entire life. That was extremely fascinating and uh, brought us to this whole new level of perceiving. I wanted to ask you on this note that I've been talking to many, many women in particular around the world these days who have been really, you know, starting to feel that openness that you're talking about, you know. But what happens, and I guess in Tantra we would call that, you know, walking the razor's edge. What they're saying is that they start to feel that opening, that new doorway into the field, but and that, you know, uh, excites them and animates them. But then what happens is that all these other little dark thoughts, especially being projected by those around them, and if like they're like many people have become addicted to the media, 
you know, then the, it, the darkness starts to come in again. So what is your advice when you're in that kind of situation where you're fluctuating between this real uh, basking in the field and then feeling the opposite kind of encroaching in your life? What can you say to help these people? Mm, yeah. Well, life is an alchemical journey, isn't it? So what I mean by that is that you cannot have yin without yang and you cannot have yang without yin. Um, a principle that has been very useful to me to recognize in my life is that when I perceive there to be darkness outside of me, when I feel that something is is evil or wrong and i have a lot of of anger about it and i have a lot of emotion about it um what i find to be a good practice is to consider is there anything about myself is there anything about my own life that that i have a quality of that shadow in is there a place where i'm not in total integrity with my thoughts or with my words? Um, is there a way that I'm not showing up all the way for the environment? Is there a way that I'm angry because I haven't taken the power of my own leadership and spoken out strongly about what I believe in? And so because I have uh, these areas in myself which have been blocked, I am triggered and deeply affected by seeing those things outside of me in the world. And so when I see a leader who's saying they're speaking their mind and saying horrible things, I'm only really angry because I'm not taking responsibility for myself and being that leader and speaking what I need to speak to make that change. Um, this is a, a very, very deep initiation to go through. And anyone who's a practitioner of Tantra or energy studies or uh, Qigong or Tai Chi, you will have to face this dialectic at some point. The reality that what you perceive outside of you that triggers you the most is also usually a part of you. Now, there is a beautiful solution to this dilemma, of course, which is that as we grow in awakening and empowering and joy and light, we may also see and become more aware of shadow and darkness and, and hate and war and destruction. Consciousness does not isolate itself to one polarity or another. In other words, you can't just see more joy in the world. In order to see more joy in the world, you will also see more pain. And this is natural and it's okay. In fact, you may experience more pain as you experience more joy. Um, the Buddha's solution to this is to walk the middle path. And so to, you know, moderate how much joy or how much pain you feel. Uh, but I think there's a higher translation to that, which is that in, in essence, what we want to do is no longer resist the joy when it comes and also no longer resist the pain. And what this means for someone who is feeling a lot of the projections of the world and feeling the collective consciousness swirl through, it actually means taking more time to really allow those feelings to flow and really accept both the a beautiful, amazing experience of awakening and joy and bliss and pleasure and orgasmic potential, which we are all gifted with. And also when we are feeling the collective difficulty and the pain, and that is reflected to us in a relationship or uh, through close friends or through community or through the news and what's happening in the world, that we actually take the time to feel the pain and the anger and the grief that may be arising around all of that as well. And if we can allow ourselves to let this field flow through us, 
and we are no longer resisting it, then we've now created enough space within our being that the experience of the pain and the sadness can actually be as pleasurable as the experience of the joy and happiness, because our bodies have this incredible capacity to experience pleasure simply from the movement of energy. And it doesn't matter whether that movement of energy is qualified as the emotion of grief or the emotion of anger or the emotion of happiness or joy or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter what it's called. It's just energy. And we are, you know, framing the idea of what that energy is based on its frequency, because, of course, these things have different frequencies. Um, But the frequency, for example, of anger, um, which is this intense, is the same frequency as passion because you want to grab and love so much. It's the same frequency and it it has the same amount of fire in it. Um, But either way, letting it flow is actually what's important and allowing it to move through you without getting stuck is really the key. And this requires actually learning how to open up the channels in our body and circulate our chi more proficiently. I'm sure that some of your other speakers will probably cover ideas like uh, the microcosmic orbit in the body, understanding that the breath can be used to move energy up the spine and allow it to cascade down the front of the body. And as you build up saliva in your mouth through some of these breaths to swallow that gold golden nectar and anchor it down in the Dantian. Um, There's also many other breaths pulling down the front of the body through the nose. Um, There's cyclical uh, breaths we can do with the nose and the mouth alternating. And these different breath techniques, as well as the techniques that you will learn if you learn basic Qigong postures or you develop full proficiency in a 48 posture form of Tai Chi Chuan. These are designed to help you open up these spaces for that current to flow. And one of the things that I share with all of my students that I think is really critical to this particular part of the conversation is that as you develop the capacity to allow more energy to flow through your body, it is also more and more important that you develop a strong ground current. When you have a house, the amount of electricity that you can run through that house is based on one thing, and that's how strong the ground current is. If there's not a good ground in the house, then things short circuit. The same is true of the body. If you don't have a good ground current, if you're not anchored and connected to the earth that you're standing on, then your body's going to short circuit. And this is one of the major problems with the sort of ascension mentality and the idea that we're all just trying to raise our energy and go up through all of our chakras and we're going to ascend beyond the physical is that if you really practice that all the time, what happens is you become less and less and less grounded. And then sure, maybe you eat less food or you, you know, do certain things a different way, but your ability to show up in this world and meet the challenges of this world and the the sort of tactile nature of the physical, emotional, mental energy um, can become more difficult. And you may actually feel more disconnected from people and from the earth. Whereas if your work is to bi-directionally Uh, ascend your consciousness, making it capable of perceiving more while at the same time anchoring your consciousness through the body and feeling the power of the gravity that pulls you towards the center of the earth and then thus towards the center of the earth moon system and then towards the center of the sun and then towards the center of the galaxy and then towards the center of the Laniakea galactic cluster and then towards the center of centers of this universe and then towards who knows what, then this anchoring that we do, this grounding current that goes on to infinity um, is really seen for its value and its capacity to allow us to flow as much energy as we could possibly need 
through our bodies. And this is how we develop the so-called rainbow light body or the body of light, where we literally begin to see and experience the, the actual texture of our body as being made of the field and resonant with the field of light uh, that is the braided quantum lattice of the entire universe. Thank you so much for that. These are areas of my own research. I remember telling people about grounding, just there and embodiment. You know, in my generation, we we opened up to meditation and all these different traditions. And so many people were like going out. There was a big thing, go out and you know, to these other dimensions. And and I would always say to them, Yeah, that's great, but let's take all the knowledge that we have achieved from doing that and bring it to this earth into this physical this physical body this precious human body and mm -hmm. then be able from that perspective to help us on this earth in this world with nature all around us flowing together yes thank yes. you thank you for that yes that is beautiful you know, the, I've studied some of the research of people like uh, Lynn McTaggart, who works with the field and prayer. So how do you bring, you know, on a personal level, what could you do every day to be connected with this and to really feel that this chi is flowing through your heart and opening up to heal not only yourself, but your family, your community and the world? Mm -hmm. Breathe. <laughs> uh, I will elaborate, of course. Um, but yes, to breathe, to breathe is the first key. Um, I feel strongly that it is important that when we arise in the morning, especially, that we take the time to meditate on our dreams and to remember what happened and to take notes and journal. Um, and this connects us to the field of information that we're processing subconsciously at higher levels. And then as we enter into our day, taking some time to simply get in touch with the field of energy that's in our side, our bodies. Um, and there's many practices and many ways to do that, whether you're studying Qigong or studying Tai Chi or studying pranayamic breathing, um, even yoga is, is fine and beautiful. Um, although if you do yoga, it's a very young practice and it's, it's, I think very important to also develop stillness practice and the yin practice in the body, um, getting in touch with the currents inside of the body. Um, and, and vice versa, if your practice is always standing Qigong or, um, seated meditation, uh, to also practice yang forms of, of movement and meditation, um, getting into how your body is moving and expressing energy. Uh, so there's a balance here and, and yet really just attending to the fact that you are a being of energy and that your mind is also a director of that energy. And so how you are applying your thoughts is going to be how you are applying that energetic field. It's something that, you know, even after all these years is still always a challenge for me because it's, you know, you wake up and if you, first thing you do, you check your phone and then oh, there's this person and they need this thing from you. And then you're like, oh, why do I have to do this right now? And then all of a sudden your mind is frustrated and then you don't want to do that thing, but then you're going to do it anyway. So it gets you out of bed and it's like, you go to do that thing. And now you're like feeling frustrated because now somebody else wants something from you. And that's in the middle of happening. And, and this, and you get caught in this flow. And now what's happening is your mind doesn't have the clarity of space that it needs in order to formulate the field and your experience the way that innately would be most pleasurable and most alive for you. And so your mind is being pushed here and there to this thing and that thing. And so guess what's happening to your chi? <laughs> and then also guess what's happening to your body? 
is you're getting jerked around by the universe. And so just taking a moment and getting back to your center, having a breath, getting really quiet and just noticing how do you feel? What's moving inside of you? Where do you feel tightness? And can you breathe into those places? And relax them. Notice your shoulders. Notice especially your face. In Tai Chi and Qigong techniques, the face is very important because your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your ears and all the muscles in your face are connected to organs in your body. And so if you have tension in your face, you also have tension in those organs and that will constrict energy flow inside of your body. So relaxing the face, you can even massage your face. You can massage your ears and give yourself that moment of treatment that time to contemplate and to be aware of where you're at and what you're feeling in yourself and that alone that pause as richard beautifully calls it in his art of contemplation book that pause that you're creating to allow you to get back in touch with your center your body, your energy, your field now returns you to the place of command where now you are in the pilot seat of your body starship. And from that pilot seat, now you can determine this is what I'm going to say yes to. And this is what I'm going to say no to. This is what I'm going to accept. And this is what I'm not going to. Okay. There may be five people that are trying to get my attention right now for this thing, or I have like 20 emails to respond to. I'm not, that's not my concern right now. Right now, my concern is coming from a centered place and getting myself back in gear. Do I need food? Do I need water? Do I need to breathe out some emotions? Do I have some grief? Do I have any belief systems in play right now that are not serving me? Let's do a system check, refresh. And then when you feel like, okay, <sighs> Now I'm good. Now you go take care of the things you need to take care of. Now you respond to those messages. Now you respond to those emails. Now you deal with your business and life, but you're coming to it from your center and from an empowered place. And if we learn how to live our lives like that, the same way that we practice that in Tai Chi or Qigong, moving from the Dantian, moving from the center, then we will experience our life beginning to flow with the same grace that we can experience our body moving inside of that practice. And you asked about the heart as well. Well, as we cultivate this circulation of chi and cultivate the field inside of us, we both cultivate the lower Don Tien, uh, two inches below our belly button, down in our pelvis, as well as we begin to fill and overflow the center Don Tien, um, which sits uh, sort of behind and above the, the heart, which is in some traditions called the soul seat, um, but is sort of like the, 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 um, the heart center uh, within our central channel, within our, our line vertically. And then we have a higher Dantian, which sits in the center of our head. And that Dantian is uh, sort of a regulator for the upper three chakras, as the lower Dantian is a regulator of the lower three chakras. And the heart Dantian and the heart chakra are regulators for the whole system. So they're like navigators that help to balance and align the entire system. So we, of course, want to cultivate that heart field and really develop the center of our electromagnetic torque because our heart is the strongest electromagnetic generator of the body. And so this is where we are really pumping and generating the quantum field all around us. Also, we're very excited on that note to have Master Li Junfeng, who teaches the uh, Shenzhen Gong, which is the well, actually Shenzhen meditation. 
which is the meditation of unconditional love. So all of you out there, he's also an extraordinary master who will expand upon Adam's teaching in terms of the heart feel and opening the heart and discovering that sense of unconditional love beyond, you know, just what we're holding, how to open your heart and, and feel this love, not only for yourself, but all humanity. Adam, it's been such a pleasure. Please tell us Thank how you. we get in touch with you. Yeah, so um, I have online academies, as you mentioned. Um, the easiest way to find me is if you just Google Adam Apollo, uh, I'll come right up. And uh, my personal website, adamapollo.com. For all of you out there, I'm sure now you see why I asked Adam to be a part of the Qigong Global Summit. He has so much richness and depth of his exploration for so many years that he's brought to us today. So thank you so much, Adam. Such a pleasure and honor. Thank you so much, Sharon, for having me. And I hope to join you again in the future. Yes. And to all of you out there, from our hearts to yours, from the SHIP Network and out into the world, unify.org, have a beautiful Chi Phil Day. Mm, blessed be. Thank you for joining us for the Chi Gung Global Summit. To learn about our global community, visit theshiftnetwork.com. And please share these powerful sessions with your friends and family.